In this video, we're going to take everything we know about elimination reactions, specifically the E1, and what we know about rearrangement reactions, and we're going to combine them together into one problem, combining elimination and rearrangement. So, if you're up for it, why don't you try working out what the product of this reaction would be. So press pause, work on it by yourself. When you're ready, press play, we'll go through it, see how you do. Okay, let's have a look at this problem here. So what we're doing is we're taking this alcohol that you can see is a secondary alcohol in the five membered ring, cyclopentane ring with two methyl groups, and we're adding sulfuric acid, H2SO4 to this. And the question is, what do we get? What do we get from this? So actually, let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, good. So first thing to do, um, well, it can't hurt to number carbons. And it also can't hurt to just draw in some of the, the implicit or hidden hydrogens as well. You don't have to do it for all. It usually helps around where you think might be the reactive center. Um, that's going to help just to keep track of the fact that you have hydrogens there. Sometimes you can forget that they're there, but they are. Uh, the next thing to maybe draw in is the implicit or sometimes hidden lone pairs. We've got two lone pairs on oxygen, and we can even draw in the structure of sulfuric acid as well. H2SO4, that looks like this. Draw an OH group on the sulfur, two double bonds to oxygen, and we get that. Okay, and the last thing to think about is in terms of electronegativity, EN, that's my abbreviation, EN. Okay, so hydrogen has got an electronegativity of about 2.2, oxygen is about 3.4. So that means that oxygen is going to pull these electrons, the oxygen hydrogen bond, and pull them towards it. It's going to be a little bit more negative than it normally would be. And the hydrogen is going to be a little bit more positive, actually. Let's draw it in a different color. Come on. Give it to me. Thank you. Okay. So delta minus, delta plus, delta plus, delta minus. Okay. And this means we've got a partial charges here, the delta sign. So lone pair is going to, this is, <laughs> again, a kind of long, complicated way of saying that our oxygen is going to be a base here. It's going to remove a proton from sulfuric acid and we're going to break the OH bond. And we don't have a question mark here anymore. We actually have a product. So it would look like this. What bond are we forming? What bond are we breaking? We are forming oxygen to hydrogen, and we are breaking oxygen to hydrogen. So we're going to form this. And we have O, S, double bond O, double bond O, OH, negative charge and we can draw in H here. Now what's going to happen is this lone pair we've gone from having two lone pairs on oxygen to now we only have one so we're going to have a positive charge on our oxygen. As it turns out this is going to be a much better leaving group. Much better leaving group and it's going to be we're also going to have uh, the conjugate base of sulfuric acid floating around as well. Now, so this is protonation. So what's the key step in the E1 reaction? The key step, the slow step, the step that makes it a unimolecular rate determining step. Well, it is loss of the leaving group. Loss of leaving group. And that's why protonation is so important here, right? We're going from OH minus as a leaving group, which would be a bad leaving group, to OH2, or water, as a leaving group. And that is good, because it's a weak base. So we're going to take that pair of electrons from the carbon-oxygen bond, we're going to move it to the oxygen. That is going to give us this. Okay. And then we'd have a hydrogen here. We would have water floating off into the ether, it's not really ether, floating off into the solvent. And we would form a carbocation here. Now, again, think about carbocation stability. What, and that's really the first question you always want to ask yourself is, what's the order of carbocation stability? Tertiary is more stable than secondary, which is more stable than primary, actually much more stable. What type of carbocation do we have here? Well, it is a carbocation. 
and it is a secondary carbocation. Secondary carbocation. So the question is, will it rearrange? Will it rearrange? Well, if we have a secondary carbocation, if there was some way to make it into a tertiary carbocation, then it would rearrange. If it can only become another secondary carbocation or a primary carbocation, then it's unlikely to rearrange. So let's have a look at its neighbors. Uh, that's really going to answer the question whether or not it's going to rearrange. And we can sometimes call this the alpha carbon. Um, the carbons next door to the alpha carbons we call the beta carbon. And if we look at this carbon here, we see that this is a secondary carbon. So if we draw in what hydrogens are here, we've got two hydrogens, what would a rearrangement look like here? Well, rearrangement would look like this. We'd have a hydrogen going from that carbon to the next one over. We'd have another secondary carbocation that is not any more stable than our initial carbocation. So that's unlikely to happen. So it's unlikely to happen. What about on the other side here? We've got a carbon that's attached to four carbons. So we call it a quaternary carbon. So this is a candidate for rearrangement because if we can move, not a hydride, because we don't have any hydrogens to move, but if we could move a CH3 or an alkyl group, then we would be in business because that would give us a more stable tertiary carbocation. So let's do that. So we're going to take that pair of electrons, we're going to move it over. This is going to be step three. Now this isn't a hydride shift because we're not moving hydrogen, we're moving an alkyl. So this is an alkyl shift. And if we had to maybe draw out what this would look like, it might help to redraw everything out. Just redraw it all out and then and then we can sort of show, show what the product looks like after that. So a pair of electrons goes there. All right, and so that is gonna give us what? Well, we're going to, this pair of electrons between carbon and carbon, it's gonna break. So we're going to break this carbon-carbon bond. And this is actually gonna to lead to a carbocation being present because now this carbon is no longer bonded to, uh, not sh no longer sharing a pair of electrons with that CH3. The CH3 has taken them. And the CH3 is going to be bonded to this carbon, which is no longer a carbocation because now it's sharing this pair of electrons. So basically the CH3 has just taken this pair of electrons, like a, almost like a windshield wiper. It's kind of boop, it's a boop, flipped over that pair of electrons to the adjacent carbon. And we can, we can kind of redraw this here. So CH3, positive charge. All right. And so this gives us this, which is now what? Now it's a tertiary carbon. Carbo, actually tertiary carbocation. Exclamation point. Okay, great. So. Now, we said that this is an E1 reaction with a rearrangement. So we've already done the rearrangement, tertiary carbocation, which is stable. So now we need to do our elimination reaction. And for elimination, we remember Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule is we always form the most so let's draw it up a little bit higher. Always form the most substituted alkene. That's Zaitsev's rule. Okay, so when we're thinking about this, what type of alkene we might form here, let's, let's think about what's going on. So we're gonna to have to remove, remember an elimination reaction, the second step is we're gonna to have to remove a proton from one of the, the carbons next door to our carbocation, and we call those the beta positions. So we have an alpha carbocation, or alpha carbon is a carbocation, 
we're going to need to remove a proton from one of the beta carbons. And we look at which beta carbon we could remove a hydrogen from, which would give us the more substituted alkene. Well, if we removed, removed our hydrogen from here, this would give us a tri-substituted alkene because we'd still have one hydrogen attached. And we can even draw the product, what that would look like up here. So it would look like this. Okay. So that would be tri-substituted. And that's not actually quite as good as if we were to remove a hydrogen from this other beta carbon up here, which we called carbon one. If we do that, uh, that will actually give us the product that we desire. So what can we do is we can show a pair of electrons, let's say from water, taking a proton, and we can sort of show that pair of electrons moving down there and forming this product. And that would give us this, which is now a tetrasubstituted alkene. Okay. And it would also give us H3O plus. We'd also have that, that plus would probably partner up with the CL, the, uh, the O, actually not the O, the uh, OSO3H from the sulfuric acid. Um, so we're always going to form a, a, a ion pair here. We never want to have an unbalanced charge. So that would that's what the product of this E1 reaction with rearrangement would go. So we have protonation, loss of our leaf, so we form a better leaving group. We lose water, water is a weaker base, better leaving group form a secondary carbocation. Now we could rearrange to a more stable carbocation by moving uh, the alkyl group over here. So we showed that here, we move this CH3 over. And then in our last step, we did uh, a deprotonation reaction. So step four was deprotonation. And that gives us our final product, which is our tetra-substituted alkene.